So this is a video that I've known I was going to make for a while now, but I recently had an experience uh, just a few days ago, or actually more more than a week ago, but like 10 days ago, that really inspired me to make this video and, you know, just pump it out as quickly as possible. It's on a class of drugs called gabapentinoids. Now, gabapentinoids, they are not seen in the medical world to have a very high abuse potential, and they have an extremely wide range of therapeutic benefits, so it's really not that hard to get a prescription, at least from my, what I've seen. But drug users are really starting to realize the recreational potential of these drugs, and it's like every day I hear about some new person that has a dependence on gabapentinoids. And because of that reason, doctors are really, I think, starting to be more careful with who they're prescribing them to and, you know, making sure that they don't prescribe them as much, but still, it's much easier to get a prescription for gabapentinoids than something like benzodiazepines or opioids or Z-drugs. I don't know, I mean, I've just always really wanted to make this video for a while now because I really think that this is an underappreciated class of drug and there's not that much information out on these drugs. Gabapentinoids are actually my number one favorite class of GABAergic drug that I have tried. Uh, I really love isoxazoles, and I think that they are very, very interesting chemically, but of course, I've never tried them. I'm dying to try Ambien or any other Z drug. That is like one of my top 10 drugs that I'm dying to try. And from what I've read about it, I feel like it would be very enjoyable, and it also has an extremely interesting chemistry as well. Of course, GHB is supposed to be heavenly. Dying to try methacolone, as it seems the rest of the world is, along with all the other quinazolinones. And then weird alcohol derivatives and barbiturates. I've heard great things about all these different GABAergics, but they're almost impossible for me to acquire. And I do think that diazepines can be enjoyable, but I have tried a lot of them. And while they're by no means unpleasant, just so many other drugs that I've tried are much more enjoyable than diazepines. And they're very dangerous, very addictive, terrible withdrawals, cognitive deficits, um, you know, just never been my type of drug. Uh, and I am an alcoholic. I have had an addiction to alcohol alcohol, but I hate the fact that it's just so physically taxing on the body, and I hate hangovers, those just absolutely suck, and to be honest, I've drinking so much in my life, it's almost old, just because it was one of the first drugs I've ever tried, and I just don't feel the desire to get drunk anymore at this time in my life. But gabapentinoids are absolutely fucking phenomenal. They are amazing, and in my opinion, like a lot of other drugs, they are not talked about half as much as they deserve to be. In the past year, I've gotten more and more obsessed and into gabapentinoids, and I had my peak gabapentinoid obsession earlier this week. So, I think we should start out with the history. The history the history of GABAergics is quite interesting, and I touched on this in the Xanax video, but I'm going to touch on it again. Excluding all plants, the first ever widely used GABAergic drug was ethanol, and ethanol itself is pretty enjoyable and can have a lot of medicinal benefits. It's good for your nerves, it used to be used in a lot of very, very early surgeries, and altogether had a lot of uses, but it did have problems. It was addictive, it had a risk of overdose, extremely problematic withdrawals that could kill you, it wasn't healthy and not very pleasant to consume, and I believe that the next very widely used GABAergics after ethanol were things like diethyl ether, chloral hydrate and chloroform right here and these were much better anesthetics and alcohol was not used medicinally ever again right these drugs still did have a lot of problems but they were more medicinal and just much more better from medicinal and therapeutic use but they were still also addictive dangerous and so problematic that they're really not used anymore at all ever all throughout history everyone has been trying to develop better gabaergics barbiturates were created with um which are much better than other very early sedative hypnotics, but they're still very dangerous. They had terrible safety ratios. You could die if you had one glass of alcohol combined with your prescribed dose, and they're very addictive with hellish withdrawals that could kill you, right? They got demonized a lot, but they're still a lot better than the earlier GABAergics, and there were no alternatives for a while. There has been a quest or goal in the medicinal world to try and find better GABAergics, and people have succeeded. Benzodiazepines were invented, which still are very problematic and are also very demonized, but they cannot kill you as long as you do not mix them with other drugs. That is a huge pro. Still, Benzos are very fucked, and I would not consider them to be a very good replacement for worse GABAergics. Only positive is that they're potent, cheap, and it's harder to overdose on them. Non-benzodiazepine Z drugs are the same. Things like Ambien, Imavane, Lunesta, Zopiclone, Esopiclone, Zaloplon, GABAergics that cannot kill you on their own, but are still very dangerous when combined with other drugs, and also create a lot of dependence and have some of the worst withdrawals of, you know, any drug ever, just as bad as Benzo. There are some GABAergics that I think are very good replacements and that do not have the same problems as most GABAergics. There are two classes of drugs like that. One is isoxazole. Things like muscimol and gaboxidol. And, you know, isoxazole groups are found everywhere in nature and in many different drugs that I have included here. But I'm only talking about the primarily GABA agonist isoxazoles, and they are found in the Amanita muscarium mushroom. Sadly, none of them are on the pharmaceutical market because some people had hallucinatory uh, effects, very intense hallucinatory effects, actually. And because of this, even though people also got hallucinations with ambient, gaboxidol specifically was taken off the market. Because of this, we know very little about the drug, but from what I've read, they're not really that dependence forming, uh, at least not as much as other GABAergics, and the withdrawals are not extremely intense. And they also have a pretty good safety ratio, and it would not be particularly easy to overdose on them. The other GABAergic that I think is amazing is gabapentinoids, and these drugs will be the subject of this video. We will be mainly covering gabapentin, pregabalin, phenema, and baclofen in this video, but there are many more, and I might briefly touch on the others, but 
but these are the main ones that we'll be talked about, and these are also the main ones that are most commonly used and abused. Gabapentinoids were designed as analogs of the neurotransmitter GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. And I thought that GABA was unable to cross the blood-brain barrier, but as I was reading and doing research for this video, I found out that there recently has been some evidence suggesting that it might be able to. Whatever the case is, if you take GABA, it's a very popular supplement, jack shit will happen, right? You won't get high. And if you do notice anything, it will be after taking it daily for an extended period of time. And even if you do notice something after an extended period of time, it will most likely be very, very, very subtle. Uh, they sell GABA supplements at grocery stores all over the US. I've taken it daily for months and noticed absolutely nothing. Now, when additions are made to GABA chemically, uh, specifically to GABA's beta carbon, these allow the GABA pentanoids to cross the blood brain barrier uh, much more easily, unlike normal GABA. Now, me calling GABA pentanoids GABA ergics is kind of misleading. A lot of these drugs do not pr primarily affect GABA at all and actually cause sedation and other primary effects via other means, right? Some do, Phenomat, for example, and Baclofen are GABA B agonists, but Phenomat also has a lot of other actions that are typical to other GABA pentanoids as well and that do not affect GABA in any other way. The only reason I'm referring to them as GABA ergics or as replacements to GABA ergics is because a lot of the time they are prescribed for the same thing that other GABA ergics are prescribed for, sleep, anxiety, seizures, etc. The only thing that GABA pentanoids are prescribed for that typical GABA ergics are not prescribed for is neuropathic pain. Another reason why I am referring to them as GABA ergics or comparing them to GABA ergics is because with all of my personal experience with GABA pentanoids, they do have very similar effects to other GABA ergics that I have used like diazepines, alcohols, and sadly those are really the only two classes of GABA ergic drugs that I have extensive experience with. Besides maybe carvalactones, I guess, but if I was given a gabapentinoid blindly and I had to guess the mechanism of action based purely off of what I felt, I would guess that it would affect the GABA system in some way. Alright, now I'm going to go over the main gabapentinoids, the chemistry, the pharmacology, and my experience with them. First off, we have gabapentin, right? This is the classic gabapentinoid that everyone knows. Uh, it's the most commonly prescribed gabapentinoid, in my opinion. Uh, it has seen a lot of recreational use and it's becoming more and more popular. Doctors are kind of starting to catch on that these drugs are actually a lot more abusable than previously thought, and they are a lot more addictive than what is shown in the medical literature. Uh, and for this reason, it's getting harder and harder to get a prescription. It was originally designed by some German company, and they were trying to create an analog of GABA that could more easily cross the blood-brain barrier, and they just had the carbon at this three position become part of a cyclohexane ring, and all of a sudden, it could cross the blood-brain barrier much more easily. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the pharmacology uh, and neurobiology in this video, and people know that I don't usually enjoy talking too much about the brain, but I'm going to do that a lot in this video because I think that it's critical that the mechanism of action of these gabapentinoids is fully understood, and I also think it's very interesting, but I don't want to get too complicated. Uh, gabapentin does not directly modulate GABA receptors. It's not a GABA agonist. Its main action is the fact that it blocks voltage-gated calcium ion channels. Uh, I don't want to explain the entire way a neuron world works. You know, if you're interested, you can research it yourself. But essentially, VDCCs, or voltage-dependent calcium channels, allow neurons to function normally and fire. Calcium is what pushes something called ventricles to the end of a cell, which makes the neuron release neurotransmitters, and when these calcium channels are blocked, neurons are more docile, and that is primarily where gabapentin effects come from. It prevents the release of excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate, epinephrine, etc. Gabapentin also inhibits 4-aminobutyrate transaminase, also called gabatransaminase, and activates glutamate decarboxylase. These are both enzymes, and all this does essentially is increase the biosynthesis and concentration of GABA in the brain. Uh, a lot of the rest of the mechanism of action is not fully understood. Studies have shown that gabapentin creates an increase in GABA, or of GABA in the brain, and a decrease in glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, although the primary effects of the drug come from the blockage of voltage-dependent calcium channels. Gabapentin is prescribed for just a ton of stuff, mood disorders, depression, sleep, anxiety, etc., but one of the most common things is neuropathic pain. If you have nerve pain, gabapentin is supposed to be am amazing with helping with that, much better than you know, something like opioids. All right, now the last thing to talk about before we get into my personal experience is that the bioavailability of gabapentin dramatically increases with the dose, right? And this fucking sucks because the dose needed to get any good recreational effects is much larger than the prescribed dose. Uh, it's prescribed in doses from 100 to 800 milligrams, and I've heard very mixed things about the dose needed for recreational effects. I have heard someone say that he gets adequate recreational effects at a dose as small as 600 milligrams, but people need to take well over a gram sometimes, and sometimes even 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams or more with no tolerance to get desired recreational effects. 
The drug is dependent on a transport system with amino acids to get into the brain, and there is a finite amount of these amino acids. Some people say that you can just take a diet dose of gabapentin all at once to get high, and that does work for some people, but I would say that that's a waste of your gabapentin. If you go on Reddit, there are all these guides on how to take gabapentin for recreational use, and the gist of it is that you would probably ideally eat a very, very fatty meal before you consume your gabapentin. Fatty acids can theoretically increase the bioavailability of gabapentin, so it can't hurt to do that, and then many people say to take like 300 milligrams of gabapentin every 15 to 30 minutes for like a long amount of hours, many hours, uh, sometimes, you know, until you reach 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams or, you know, different doses. Uh, now, this really sucks, and gabapentin is the only gabapentin that I know of that has this shitty bioavailability, and I think that the problem of bioavailability has been solved by a formulation of gabapentin called gabapentin in acarbol. Uh, brand name Horizont, which is just a pro drug to gabapentin, but just getting normal gabapentin is much more common and it's very hard to get Horizont. I've never seen anyone with a prescription for it. I first encountered gabapentin on the street and there was this friend of mine who had some and I was told that when combined with opioids, it will potentially increase the effects. Uh, this is a common known thing among opioid users. There are many different drugs that are known to potentiate or increase the effects of opioids and gabapentin is one, hydroxazine, muscle relaxants, promethazine, of course, and there are just all these well-known drugs that are known to potentiate opioids. And I wouldn't recommend using them because the reaction between them and opioids can be very dangerous. But when I first took gabapentin, I just took like two 800 milligram gabapentin pills with some Oxycontin. And they might have increased the effects a little bit. I don't know if it was placebo, but that was the first time I encountered it. And then I knew a drug dealer who was selling gabapentin, and she sold 800 milligram pills for a dollar each, which seemed extremely cheap to me. So I bought a bunch of them and ate a fatty meal, and I took one 800 milligram pill every 30 minutes for two hours until I reached 3,200 milligrams. And I might have felt something very small, but it wasn't very significant and it might have been placebo. I used gabapentin several times after that, you know, just whenever I encountered it, if a friend had a prescription, which seemed to be very common, or whenever anyone was selling it, uh, because it was just so ridiculously cheap, and I just had read all these reports where people were praising how good the high felt, and I never got any significant effects. Until one day when I took 300 milligram pills every 30 minutes just for no reason. I thought, fuck it, and wasn't expecting much. I don't even remember my dose. I just took one or two pills about every 30 minutes. After I'd done that, I don't know, until like I ran out of pills, I got an amazing fucking high. Literally, it was almost just as good as an opioid high, but it was different. It felt very relaxed, euphoric, no anxiety, and I even had some closed eye visuals. I took it in the afternoon, and it lasted the entire day until I went to sleep at night, and I fell asleep super easily. I had confidence. It was just so smooth, better than any benzodiazepine high I have ever felt. And then I realized why people love gabapentin so much. I only encountered it like two or three times after that, and those two or three times I took much lower doses and had a similar experience. To the first time, relaxing euphoric high, not as intense as the first time, but that was probably because it was a lower dose. It was really, really, really fun. You know, the last time I used gabapentin was over a year ago, and I would be very interested in trying it recreationally again. Uh, I even tried to get a prescription for gabapentin or pregabalin, and my psychiatrist basically told me to go fuck myself. He didn't use those exact words, but he would not prescribe me a gabapentinoid, and I think that he knew of my history with illegal drugs and probably thought that I was going to abuse the prescription. But, you know, I have met people since with gabapentin prescriptions and I always almost get jealous and they're always like, it doesn't do anything for me, right? You know, it doesn't get me high at all. But just know that this drug, if taken correctly, has the potential to give an amazing high. And I heard people say that they liked it better than hydrocodone or Adderall. And to be honest, that experience that I had was much better than a low dose of hydrocodone. Uh, not a high dose, but a low dose that wouldn't make me nod out, you know, of hydrocodone. And I would choose gabapentin over Adderall any day, uh, over a low dose of Adderall, right? But also know that there is tolerance increase, and from what I have heard, it can have very shitty withdrawals. So addiction is a real possibility, but the withdrawals can't really kill you, so, you know, that's great. Next off, we have pregabalin. Uh, this is a very therapeutic gabapentinoid, but also has the highest abuse potential. For this reason, it isn't prescribed as much as gabapentin, but it is still very therapeutic and is the most effective gabapentinoid at treating neuropathic pain. But, like all other gabapentinoids, it is also prescribed for seizures, sleep, anxiety, etc. The pharmacology of pregabalin is very similar to that of gabapentin, so structurally similar to other gabapentinoids. It has an isobutyl group on the three position of GABA, and it is one of the more potent gabapentinoids, right? It doesn't have the same issue with bioavailability that gabapentin has. And pregabalin, like a lot of other gabapentinoids, does not in any way directly affect GABA, but similar to gabapentin, extremely high doses can increase the biosynthesis of GABA, and some evidence shows, shows that it may increase GABA uptake slowly over time, so that's like actually a decrease in GABA. You know, it's very similar to gabapentin in the fact that it also blocks voltage-gated calcium ion channels, the same ones that gabapentin actually blocks, specifically the alpha-2 delta subunits and the alpha-1 delta subunits, which are, you know, the same as gabapentin. So very similar to gabapentin, pregabalin is also very useful because unlike a lot of other calcium channel blockers, 
suppressors. It doesn't slow down the heart and is therefore much less dangerous than a lot of other drugs that do similar things. So I sadly have no experience with pregabalin. All other gabapentinoids are prescription only, but not scheduled, while pregabalin is prescription only and scheduled five in the US. So, uh, you know, it is very recreational, very legal. Uh, you can go online and read all the reports of recreational use of this drug. Recreational use usually requires a dose that is a little bit higher than the prescribed dose, but not insanely higher, like with gabapentin. And people who write these reports talk about how much they love this gabapentinoid, right? I have read a lot about many gabapentinoids, and pregabalin is by far, from what I have read, the most euphoric based on reports. Now, I don't know if people are exaggerating in reports, but I have read many where people say that pregabalin is their all-time favorite drug ever, right? Better than any benzo or any amphetamine, they just fucking love it. Better than any opioid, right? It's not such a big problem here, but I knew though, know that in some places in Europe, specifically Ireland, they're having a huge pregabalin crisis with addiction, right? I've never seen it sold anywhere on the street in the US, but in Europe, it's like one of the most commonly asked for pills on the street, apparently. They also are making very strict laws on pregabalin. Now, baclofen. So, baclofen is pretty easy to get. People don't usually consider it to be an abusable drug, and it is prescribed in very low doses as a muscle relaxant. Uh, people with back pain use it. It's used by many people to prevent spasticity, and it's just a muscle relaxer like cyclobenzaprine. It's also recently been able to be very effective as a way of treating dependence to alcohol or GHB, actually, which is the mechanism of action that I'm actually very interested in concerning baclofen. Unlike other GABA pentanoids talked about here, baclofen is actually a GABA B agonist, and through this primary action also inhibits the release of excitatory neurotransmitters, which is what most gabapentinoids do, but not through GABA agonism. Well, the pharmacology of baclofen is through GABA agonism, but Overall, a lot of the pharmacology is not fully understood very well. Uh, I did read some things that claim the anti-addictive effects from baclofen may be caused by dopamine antagonism, uh, but that is not known for sure. And, you know, if you go online, a lot of people absolutely just praise how much they love baclofen and how it, you know, cured them from their alcohol dependence and is really... In my opinion, from what I've read, it might be one of the best options to treat alcohol dependence. You know, like people just take it, they don't have any withdrawals, any cravings, and you know, it's really great for that. And it is becoming much more popular for, you know, treating addiction to other more serious GABA ergics. After the GABA B receptor was actually first discovered, a lot of early research on that receptor was done with baclofen. And baclofen was first synthesized in 1962, which is pretty early, as most of the GABA pentanoids discussed in this video were discovered much later. And the GABA B receptor was identified in 1979. And it was partially discovered using baclofen, where Dr. Norman Bowery, who discovered the GABA-B receptor, saw that baclofen provided effects that could not be traced to the already known GABA-A receptor. So baclofen was partially responsible for the discovery of a whole new type of receptor. Uh, if you go online and look up recreational use of baclofen, you will hear a lot of mixed things. Uh, I'm going to say about... 60% of people do not believe that it is abusable and provides little to no recreational effects. Now, I did read some reports where people were praising it, said that, you know, at higher doses it's amazing and one of their favorite drugs, and uh, when I finally was able to acquire some, I took 35 milligrams for my first time, 35 milligrams of baclofen, and I had a pretty positive experience. Uh, the one thing that really caught me off guard was the muscle relaxation. Every single muscle in my body felt extremely relaxed, right? The only other muscle relaxer that I have taken besides baclofen would be Valium, and I loved the muscle relaxing effects from diazepam. It made all my muscles feel all liquidy and good, but baclofen made my mu muscles feel just relaxed, right? It was different from Valium, and moving almost felt like a chore, but in a really good way, right? I also got a light, very, very subtle euphoria, right? I almost want to say that my body felt totally barred out, like, physically, but my mind felt clear, if that makes sense, right? Overall, it was a very enjoyable experience, and when I mixed it with some Kratom, and then later some Phenema, it just felt even better. Also, sleeping that night was extremely easy. I have a tiny bit of insomnia, uh, but with baclofen, I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow, and it seemed to be a very, very deep sleep as well. Uh, I've tried it at higher doses to aid with things like cocaine come downs, which I absolutely hate, and it didn't completely eliminate the come down at all, but it definitely did help somewhat. I think the baclofen is definitely underrated, and I've heard that it does great, amazing things at higher doses. I even read one report where someone described baclofen as being just like gabapentin, but better. And with my limited experience with gabapentin, well, I would not agree with that. You know, I do think that gabapentin was a lot better, but still, you know, I, I don't think that it is devoid of any recreational potential. Baclofen was very comparable to Phenema in a lot of ways, but not nearly as euphoric, but, you know, much more sedating with a much more pronounced body high. But, uh, Phenibut is very interesting. Uh, you know, if anyone is looking for a legal way to get intoxicated besides the use of alcohol or nicotine, uh, you will have a lot of options, right? A lot of things, people say many different things about 
a lot of other you know different legal highs i guess but in my experience the most effective option besides rcs would be kratom and or fenomut right i already made a video on kratom but i haven't talked very much about fenomut uh Phenomut is a gabapentinoid that is exactly like baclofen, except it's missing a chlorine atom. Just slap an aromatic ring on GABA, and many people think that because it's legal in a supplement and it's so easy to get, it shouldn't be treated the same as any other real drug, right? Uh, that it's lower, you know, lower danger, lower abuse potential, uh, but they are very, very, very wrong. Go on the subreddit, like r slash quitting Fenema, and you will see how addictive it is and the hell that people go through attempting to quit, right? It literally sounds like full-blown benzodiazepine withdrawals, you know, people are even hospitalized for the withdrawals, but uh, I don't think that they can kill you, which is still better, but still, you know, it's not something you really want to be messing around with. It's actually illegal in Australia, the United Kingdom, France, Hungary, Italy, and Lithuania, and it's prescription only in Russia, the Ukraine, and Belarus, and Latvia. Uh, and it showed promise and treating all of the conditions that most gabapentinoids are prescribed for, and it is even prescribed for ADHD in some cases. But uh, before going over it, I just wanted to say that when reading up a little bit on this drug, I was overwhelmed by the huge amount of information out there, right? Uh, there were a lot of very detailed studies that they had to copy and paste into Google Translate because they were in Russian, but they had huge amounts of information and so many different anecdotal reports, right? Like, there's no way I'm going to be able to go over everything in this video. Like, for example, while reading, I learned that Fenema may have visual effects for the first time. You know, I never knew that, and that's weird, so this drug is just all over the place. So, at first, Fenema was just considered to be a GABA B agonist, like baclofen, but more recently, studies have come out showing that it has a lot of action in also blocking voltage-gating calcium channels, just like gabapentinol for gabapentinol. So, with Fenema, you get GABA agonism as well as voltage-dependent calcium channels being blocked. And both of those things, about 50-50, seem to yield the core effects of Fenema. So, unlike a lot of other GABA bentonoids talked in this video, I was able to find a ton of extensive, detailed information on Fenema's mechanism of action. And it all got quite complicated. It affects different sodium and potassium channels in different ways. It inhibits different proteins. Also, like other GABA bentonoids, it could increase the biosynthesis of GABA, but that's debated. And it seems like, you know, you take all the effects exerted by all the gabapentinoids, and you just, you know, Phenomut seems to do almost everything, right? There is some speculation that it might boost dopamine as well in the brain, but there's no reliable evidence to actually prove that, and there is some evidence to show that it might antagonize dopamine, uh, like baclofen, right? So there's also that, right? Russia has used it a lot, but they're very secretive about you know, how they used it, and we do know that it was given to some Russian cosmonauts on a space mission, but that's all we know, right? Uh, not how it was used, but it was used in a space mission, and I think that's pretty cool. Fenema has become so popular everywhere, right? Like, people in the nootropic community say that it can improve cognition, and even though there's no evidence to show that, even some evidence to show that it decreases cognition, people anecdotally say that they feel smarter when taking it, and I can attest to that. Um, it's supposed to be a great replacement for alcohol in social settings among people. It has even gained some popularity in the weightlifting community as a workout supplement. I remember when I first came across Fenomut, uh, I was looking for a legal high, and Fenomut seemed to be like my best bet, right? Uh, it was a gabapentinoid, so I thought it would be great judging off my knowledge of the recreational effects of pregabalin and my experience with gabapentin. And I remember reading reports where people were saying like, you know, how the fuck is this shit legal? And I read how addictive it was and how, you know, whenever a drug is that addictive, it must give a great high, right? So I was really excited. I ordered some from Nootropics Depot a few years ago, and it never came. I ordered again from Nootropics Depot, again, never came, right? I tried Happy Hippo, Lift Mode, Zack Attack Supplements, even some weird vendors on eBay, and for some fucking reason, it just never came. And I was so mad, because I wasted so much money, and I just gave up, and you know, gave up on trying to order it, right? But then I discovered Kratom, and I got really into taking that. And then one day, I just decided to try ordering Fenema again, a couple months later, and this time it actually came. And I cannot tell you how excited I was to take this. And I took about 1.5 grams for my first time, I believe. Uh, now, this is what sucks about Fenema. You take it, and you can't eat before or while you're waiting for it to kick in. This apparently is very important. And orally, it takes four hours to kick in, which is a very long amount of time, right? So I was hungry as fuck, right? But I waited four hours, and I don't know what I was expecting, but needless to say, I was very underwhelmed. Uh, I definitely kind of felt it, but the effects were very, very, you know, subtle. Very subtle. And I was kind of pissed, right? I took more, and I noticed that that first night, I had a very easy time falling asleep, but that was it, right? I kept on experimenting with it more, and I basically thought it was kind of overhyped. I found that if I took doses as high as 5 grams, I could get something that was a little bit more of what I wanted, but still not what I was expecting, right? And I found that it was very helpful for sleep, and it did eliminate anxiety, but overall, it wasn't very noticeable, you know, through the oral, oral ROA. And I found that taking it sublingually or intranasally was much better. Throughout the nose, it hit me much faster and was 
a little bit more intense, right? Like snorting a gram can feel like 2.5 grams orally, but you know, it wouldn't last nearly as long. Uh, sublingual was kind of similar to snorting, but took like 30 minutes to kick in and lasted a little bit longer, but with less potency, but you know, still more potent than oral. Uh, I started ordering uh, the free amino acid version because it didn't burn that much when I snorted it or let it sit under my tongue. And you know, when I did take it sublingually, it was about like, I'm going to say 30% more potent. Uh, you know, I really did hate snorting it because you just have to snort so much powder and, you know, fuck up my nose. But, you know, my nose did get through it and it was, you know, pretty worth it for the high. But, you know, and when I did it sublingually, it really wasn't that hard. I hear a lot of people really like just bitch and moan about how much you have to put under your tongue, but it really was not that hard uh, for me, you know, putting it under my tongue and usually like be gone and 10 minutes, right? And I remember one time when I had to have this conversation and I was really nervous and I took Phenomat sublingually beforehand and I didn't take very much at all, only like 500 milligrams, which to me is a low dose. And I didn't notice anything obvious at all, but I did see that I didn't have any anxiety when talking this to this person and I was speaking a lot more freely and you know I was actually amazed by that this was a person that I know for a fact ordinarily talking to I would have had been you know just super super anxious and, and I was amazed by that I also found that if I mixed it with psychedelics I was more likely to have a good trip and it totally eliminated come up anxiety mixing it with stimulants like cocaine was really fun uh, it took the edge off right I loved mixing it with caffeine caffeine l and phenobut is actually one of my favorite drug combos but I still didn't get why everyone loved phenobut so much I kept on just randomly taking it, but still, I was very underwhelmed, and, you know, for almost a year, it was like that, right? But all of that changed a little over a week and a half ago, and this is the reason why I made this video. Now, a lot of factors may have contributed to this experience. Uh, I took some pretty intense drugs the day prior that may have contributed to the experience, and I think... Um, you know, I just like took two grams orally in the morning with 100 milligrams of caffeine in pill form, and then I took a gram intranasally, like an hour after I took it orally, and an unknown amount sublingually as well. And you know, I was absolutely blown away by the effects, right? I'm serious. This shit was crazy. Uh, there were so many drugs I want to compare it to. Uh, it was like I had the confidence that I get with cocaine, but I was in no way stimulated. I was so relaxed and everything was like just butter, right? Uh, I was very, very euphoric, and I get why people sometimes compare it to a low dose of MDMA. The euphoria is in no way as in your face as it is with MDMA, right? It's much more subtle, but it is there. And I felt like I could chat up with any stranger about anything. I was super talkative. Music sounded amazing. You know, I was really in love with listening to this music that I know I would not have liked that much if I was sober. It, it was very noticeable. And even, you know, even though I was super relaxed, I had this desire to work and I felt in the zone with everything. And like I could solve any problem out there, right? I felt like I could crush anything in front of me, right? I was just so confident. I was nice to everyone. My muscles definitely felt relaxed and I felt really, really good. It felt better than the way most people describe it online. You know, it, it took some of my favorite aspects from cocaine, Adderall, Vicodin, MDMA, many benzos, and every gabapentinoid I've ever tried, uh, maybe some alcohol, and just rolled it all into one with no negative effects, right? Like, so many different aspects of the high reminded me of so many different drugs, and it lasted all day, right? I had one of the best sleeps of my life that night, and I had a pretty noticeable afterglow the next day. And, you know, I, I don't know, like, one day... I just took it and it worked for me. And you know, I get why people call it magic now. I don't know why for like that past year, I took it a lot and it never worked. But I don't know, like, I don't know. I, I had taken a long break because Fenomat is really hard to get now because of the trade war with Russia. But you know, you are able to get it for kind of expensive, but to me, it's so worth it. And you know, it, it just worked. And you know, I get why people call it magic. Cause for me, my experience really was magical. It definitely was one of my top, I'm gonna say one of my top 10 favorite drug experiences ever, right? Like even, including illegal drugs, I mean, it, it was really up there, right? Like, it was really an amazing experience. Um, and, you know, you might get that too, right? But, but, you know, the next few days, I took more of it, and I got very similar effects, right? Like, it wasn't as good as this first time, but, you know, it really, it really did give me amazing effects, right? It still was magical, right? I really like snorting it because then the effects are really intense and potent and kick in super fast, but, you know, then it doesn't last so long. And I snorted a good amount a few days ago and actually found myself falling asleep while I was sitting up trying to work, right? And multiple times I was, like, daydreaming and falling asleep, right? So it can be a little bit overly sedating, but, you know, it's been great. I'm really trying to use it sparingly because I know I like this feeling a lot, and I think I'm having pretty good self-control, not perfect, but still, you know, as of now, I've noticed no rebound anxiety or withdrawal, right? No negative effects at all, right? Uh, I kid you not, that first day uh, was just so, so, so amazing. You know, I, I cannot exaggerate how awesome it was. Uh, mixing it with Kratom is absolutely blissful. I feel like I'm in the honeymoon phase with a new drug now, right? Phenobut is, as of now, one of my favorite, or my number one favorite gabapentinone. You know, I've never tried pre-gabalin, and, you know, I it was been so long since I used gabapentin, but still, right? I am just, I love Phenomat right now, right? So, you know, for me, it was always underwhelming for almost a really long time, and then one day it just hit me differently. And, you know, now I'm so also, you know, really amazed that this shit is legal, right? I feel like I should 
should mention because I feel like, I don't know, like me describing my experience might have encouraged some people to order Fenema. And, you know, I'm not against Fenema. You know, I don't think that's really a bad thing. But some other safety things is that when mixed with a lot of other GABAergics, you know, they really do potentiate each other a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, you know, you really have to be careful with benzos, of course. Uh, really do have to be careful with alcohol. Uh, you know, I've mixed it with alcohol. And, you know, like if you have a few drinks, it shouldn't be that bad, right? Uh, you'll, you'll be fine. You know, of course, depending on your dose of Fenema. But, you know, if you do get even like just moderately drunk, right? Like more than a couple of drinks. Uh, it, it, you know, it can make you pass out. I've heard of people going to the ER after mixing it with alcohol, or right? so they're really, you know, and they're really dangerous. And I don't know why you would really even need to be drinking if you're already on Fenema. You know, it's good enough in my opinion. In my experience, mixing it with alcohol really wasn't fun if I got too drunk. So, uh, you know, just, I, I wanted to put that out there. Fenema and alcohol, I would really recommend against doing that. So that's the last gabapentinoid uh, that, you know, we're going over. But there are still some gabapentinoids that I didn't talk about. Uh, there are weird things like Tolibut, which is just a methyl group um, on Fenibut's fennel ring, right? Uh, I haven't been able to find much info on it. It was invented by the Russians around the same time as Fenibut. Um, You know, sometimes apparently you can buy it on some really weird websites for very expensive uh, but even then, you know, it's just super, super, super expensive. And from the very limited reports that I have read, it's not as good as Fenimut. It's just not really a, a good drug at all, right? Like, Fenimut is much more superior. And then there is also Fluorofenimut. That has become a bit more popular in the U.S. Um, in the supplement industry. It was uh, created by a company called Bioscience, I believe, right? So it was actually invented by a supplement company really recently, like in the last like decade, I think, really new. Uh, but, you know, it's becoming more popular, more people are talking about it. Uh, it's really easy to order, and it is a lot more potent than Fenibut, similar to Baclofen, but it is not as euphoric, and from what I've heard, Fenibut is usually much more enjoyable. But some people do like Fenibut more, and I don't know, like, just... I haven't run very many reports on fluorofenamide, but I, you know, I've had he heard a lot of different things about very varied effects. Some people say that, like, it's overly sedating, some people say they don't feel anything at all, so I don't know. You know, you can experiment with that, it's kind of expensive, though. Even more rare and not talked about, even less talked about, are myrogabalin, right? Which is actually prescribed, but almost never, and it is extremely potent, you know, much more potent than other gabapentinoids. It can be recreational. I read a couple of reports on it on r slash obscure drugs, actually, you know, but not as recreational as other gabapentinoids. Uh, there's imagabalin, uh, which is one that is currently in clinical trials, and adagabalin, as well as 4-methylpregabalin, have been used in research, but I was basically unable to find anything else about them. Okay, so I really hope that you enjoyed my video on gabapentinoids. Um, you know, the Amanita muscaria video, that is like, I don't know, it's taking a really long time, and I kind of lost interest in it. You know, that video went on hold just because I had that amazing experience with Fenema, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to talk about gabapentinoids. Uh, but, you know, I, I love them, right? Like, Fenema, I have my bottle right here. I'm currently, like, waiting on some to come more from lift mode, right? Because I already used it up, but, you know, I'm really being careful. I'm not going to get addicted to it. You know, I'll keep you updated on that. Yeah, I mean, just a really amazing class of drugs, and another reason why I made it is because like there's really not that much information out there at least on youtube about the recreational use of these drugs but it, you know it is increasing in popularity i see all over you know forums everyone you know is just praising the gabapentinoids more and more and more and more and you know they really are you know i mean like my experience with fenema and gabapentin are just so euphoric so great uh, i would be very interested to hear your experience with gabapentinoids in the comment section below but otherwise peace out that was shagworth